Welcome to Second in Command, brought to you by COO Alliance, where top-level COOs share the insights, tactics, and strategies that made them the chief behind the chief. And now, here's your host, Cameron Harold. Daniela Mancinelli serves as the Chief Operations Officer of N6A, an award-winning public relations and social media agency. She oversees all operational areas, including client services and customer success, employee engagement, branding, and communications. She directly manages all of N6A's customer delivery groups and is responsible for executing on N6A's unique performance-oriented culture. Daniela has been an integral part of the rapidly scaling of the business, opening up their Toronto office in the summer of 2017, and establishing various service lines such as a robust social media program. Daniela joined N6A as vice president in 2015, and prior to joining N6A, Daniela spent over 15 years in luxury PR, branding, and marketing, including various stints with NBC Universal, Sony Pictures, Lionsgate, and Paramount. And when we were on video at the start of this podcast, you didn't look old enough to have the 15 years experience. So well done. You've been either blessed or taking care of yourself. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I, I've been lucky as well. People under under age me or under guess my age. So I'm kind of holding on to You look very young. Yeah, well, except the gray is coming in now pretty big. Can't see. It's also part of the style, so it looks good. <laughs> it's part of That's why we're doing radio only, right? <laughs> yes. So why don't you um, give us a little bit of background as to what, I guess, what some of your skills are and what you've brought to the team um, at N6A as, as COO, and maybe even in the early days, what it was about the company that you saw that you liked and what it was about Matt as a CEO that he saw in you that he liked. Yeah, so look... Um, I guess it goes back to the beginning of my career. I started off in Hollywood. So in Los Angeles, I did entertainment PR. I worked with um, television shows, personalities, also touch base uh, with event PR and some fashion. So when I met Matt um, four years ago, you know, the first thing I think it's all about chemistry, right? You have to like who, um, you know, you're going to work for. So we sat down and he was running N6A at the time. It was about 15 people, 15 to 20 people. And he had two vice presidents there, was looking for a third, um, realized that my background was very different from everyone else's. And he thought, you know, this could be a good opportunity to join hands. Um, I obviously had experience dealing, um, like I said, in entertainment, something that Matt um, you know, never really touched on. He was mostly in the marketing technology ad tech space. Uh, so I joined hands and it's been amazing ever since. Um, I started off as VP um, and what I really liked uh, about Matt is he kind of just threw me in and he said, look, um, we're going to give you a one day orientation. Um, you're going to meet your team uh, and they're going to brief you on about 15 accounts, uh, probably about 10 different industries. And I said, sure. And the next day I had, you know, directors, managers walking up to me, asking me for advice, clients calling me for one-on-one. -on -one, and I just dove in. There was something about that that I loved. Um, it was challenging. And I knew instantly that um, the way that Matt recruited was, you know, based not only on skill, but, you know, the belief um, that he has in, you know, individuals. And so he trusted me with a portfolio of accounts. And from that day, that's kind of how I've, you know, run in the company. Um, <laughs> so so that's, that's a pretty entrepreneurial environment to yeah. dive into. I mean, and typical entrepreneur to say, okay, you need one day of training. Meanwhile, he's probably been running the business for five years and knows yes. it inside and out and yeah. you you one day to catch up. Right. And then they yeah. assume you're, you're caught up too. Right. Yes. So, so how was it? How long did it take you to get up to speed? I mean, it's interesting to watch people coming from the outside in, especially into that very senior role. How long did it take you to get up to speed to where you felt you had the confidence and the competence to really pull it off in that first VP role? Look, I mean, you pull the first, you know, week you pull for your from your gut and your experience. So you're kind of and you're listening to your team members, you're trusting your managers. Um, it probably took me, I would say I felt comfortable after the first month. So it took me about four weeks to really kind of understand the landscape. And in PR, especially kind of the world that we live in, Cameron, it's every day is different. You know, you'll have a new uh, entrepreneur CEO who has just closed funding and they're pitching you this new technology and they're excited about it. And, you know, you're taking notes, you're thinking about, okay, how can we introduce it to the media? We have to do it in three days um, because we don't want anyone to scoop us. So I think, you know, having that, you know, coming from that PR environment, learning about, 
you know, navigating and pivoting, you know, through quick, I guess, decisions, I was able to, to feel semi-comfortable after a month. Okay. So I've, I've been lucky to spend a bunch of time in PR in a very different way than is the traditional um, PR. We built a, an in-house PR team at 1-800-GOT-JUNK and we only got it up to six people and we were kind of what we used to call it smile and dial. We just picked up the phone and and cranked it out and it was very guerrilla PR. But what you guys are doing is PR at a very different level. Can sure. you walk us through, um, can you give us kind of a case study of the type of client you work with, one that's maybe is a, a big success for your agency? Yeah. So look, um, by the way, dial, smile and dial used to be how I started my uh my P, my PR <laughs> career, so I can appreciate that. Um, look, now it's a little bit more organized in the sense that you know we're able to you know meet with the CMO. Um, we're able to review messaging. Some of the messaging has already been constructed for us, so if that's the case, that's a blessing. Um, and you know the, everything is sort of buttoned up in a nice package where we're able to to log in to a Dropbox, find um, bios. Um, we have spokespeople who are media trained, um, and then we're able to kind of lay out, you know, a 30 day, 90 day plan and kind of go at it in a more structured um, way. And so a company, a larger company like this would be Ladders, um, which is who we work for. I don't know if you're familiar with um, mm. sort of the recruiting uh, platform. Right. And we, on, on the other side of things, we have, um, I guess, the startup uh, folks who come in and don't have any messaging. Um, their CEO is new to media, um, maybe doesn't understand earned media and how it works. Mm. Um, and those are the ones that I also really enjoy to work with because now you're educating, you're mentoring, and you're taking them along on the journey. And you can really measure the success because they've never had uh, a media pr a footprint until now. And we're able to, you know, especially if it's a great uh, story, we're able to really show them what we can do in a matter of, you know, uh, two months to a year. Um, so that's a little bit. You, you mentioned the term earned media and I've never heard that term before, but I'm fascinated by it. I think I know where you're going. Walk, walk us through what earned media is. And is that a, a, a kind of a term that you guys have coined for yourself to create a niche or is that a, an industry term? It's an industry term. So, you know, you have folks that will come in and, you know, they want us to handle media buying, which is what we don't do. Mm. So earned media is we work on retainer. Um, a client will engage with us, um, they'll pay a retainer fee, and our job is to tell the story and work with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, get them on broadcast, um, and you know, work hand-in-hand -hand with the journalist to make sure that their story is being told and that we're inserting them in even larger stories. Um, so that's kind of the earned um, side. And the only thing we touch on is on our social media end, and we do do social media. In fact, we acquired a, an agency in 2017, like you mentioned, in Toronto that houses all of our social media. They do a bit of paid um, because now the way that you know, Facebook is run and Instagram, you're going to have to spend money in order to you know, push your brand out there. Mm -hmm. But no, we don't do any sort of advertising or you know, media buying, none of that. It's good old fashioned PR. Nice. And you, how many employees are in the company now? So we're, we're 50. 50? Okay. Yeah, and you're at, I call it kind of the real company size where you're, you're maturing from the teenage size company to the adults or, or adolescent adult size. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the growth, I guess, from 50 to 100 employees is when the culture starts to change and politics starts to creep in. But right now you're at a really interesting stage. How many would be on your leadership team? So we have um, about eight folks on the leadership team. Okay. And how many report to you and how many report to Matt? So um, Matt has three direct reports. Okay. I have about seven right now, direct okay. report. And, and what, what areas do not report to you? Um, so right now in the current moment, sales is not reporting into me directly. Um, even though this, this I have housed, especially in 2018, where I've worked hand in hand with sales, but Matt and I take that on together. Um, Matt for nine years was our sales guy. Okay. Um, and last year by design, we sort of built a team that would, um, you know, work on new business. Uh, so as, as we start to grow that team, we want Matt out of that role, even yep. though he's great at it. Yep. Um, you know, he needs to focus on CEO stuff. So, um, so everything else though, I, I can say does run through my office and, um, it's actually, it, it's probably Matt trying to pry me out of, uh, certain spaces because I love getting my hands dirty and, and working with our managers, our directors, um, with our clients. Um, so 
I think that was, that's probably the, the struggle that I've had is, you know, removing myself from what used to be very day to day life for me. Interesting. Um, I, I love that you're saying he's trying to pry you out of some areas. So before we dive into that, you talked about Matt working on some CEO stuff. Sure. I think one of the areas I think CEOs need to to be the real caretaker of his vision and yes. really rolling out that vivid vision to their company and, and explaining where we're going as a company. And then we get to figure out how to, how to go there. How do you stay on the same page with Matt and the vision that he's got for the organization? How do you kind of sign off on that vision? And then how does he sign off on your plans or your, you know, the way that you're going to go about making it come true? Sure. Um, so look, Matt and I meet at least, uh, you know, for strategic planning at least once a week. Um, you know, we have an agenda, we talk about, um, you know, the vision, what we want to do, you know, next quarter and obviously next year. Um, so we stay very much in line. Um, and when it comes to kind of my role and what I'm running, I think we've built such a relationship right now that, you know, he's able to probably finish my sentence or know the decisions that I'm going to make. So we have something called producer of the week, um, which is basically a program that identifies the top performer each week. And how we do it is we built our por a, a proprietary portal that allows folks uh, to nominate the highest performer. And so I'll get about five nominees. And it's gotten to a point where I would say Matt would probably guess who I'm going to choose because I'm responsible for choosing that performer. And so I think when you work with somebody for so long and you study, um, you know, maybe how they will tackle a challenge and, you know, vice versa, you're able to kind of, lock, you know, walk in lockstep. Um, so, you know, of course, out of courtesy and just the way that I've, um, I guess, been raised, um, I've been raised by entrepreneur uh, parents, I, I always run something by him and will say, hey, this is my decision. If you see it differently, let me know. If not, I'm going to, I'm going to execute. Cool. Usually, I, want, I, want, yeah. I want to ask you about the entrepreneur parents in a second. Sure. Tell me about the, um, I, I've always struggled especially as the company's grown to not play favorites. I end up with these people in the company that I like and that I have fun with and that we have a cool culture and we go for coffee. Um, how do you not play favorites? How do you get yourself to, to kind of give your time to the A players and work with the B players and, and give your time to people that maybe you don't have a high affinity to hang out with? So that's a great question. Um, so I actually don't have favorites. And it's, it's something that I think I've always been raised this way. I'm very fair. Um, I see everyone in the agency is, you know, equal. Um, and so I would never, and you know, it's, it, it's tough. You want to make sure that you give, you know, as much love, like you said, um, whether it's coffees or whether it's, you know, strategic meetings. Um, but, uh, you know, it's important to, to sit down one-on-one -on -one and I'll, I'll take the time to schedule coffees or bring them into my office and just ask them for feedback, whether it's uh, on a new business pitch or whether it's, you know, what we can do um, to make things better um, on the floor. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a conscious effort um, that I make um, mm -hmm. as a leader. And it's something that I've seen in other, you know, organizations um, where they've failed, in my opinion, where you can see who's kind of within that clicky you know, inner circle and who's out totally. of the circle. Yeah. And I, I'm not a big fan of that at all. Do you, um, do you work with your management team for them to, or, or let me, instead of, I almost led you with a question. Sure. No. How do you avoid silos from starting in the organization? So we've, we've put a few um, programs in place. Um, so we work with, you know, there's six groups on the floor right now. Um, and they, they work together on, let's say, 10 accounts. So it's very easy to create those kind of family within a family, you know, groups, mm. but we put a buddy system together. So we will pair, um, folks with other people on other teams. Um, and then they also get a mentor as well. And that's somebody, you know, an SVP, um, a director, myself or Matt. And so, um, we, we work really hard, um, to make sure that, you know, everyone is, uh, collaborating, well across the entire agency and there's another challenge there too cameron because we also have toronto right and so you know when we're doing happy hours in our new york office it's equally as important to make sure that you know toronto is getting ex the exact same um, love and we fly them in at least three times a year for big company events one um in fact is is called a summer bash so it's kind of a big 
a celebration where we celebrate, you know, the highest performing groups, uh, team members, and then just kind of go over, um, you know, our company cultures again. And Matt speaks and lets them know um, we review the past and then we review the future um, and everyone gets to socialize together. So that's one. And then the second would be a holiday event, which we also fly them down. Um, Next next year, it's going to be three because it's going to be our 10, 10 year anniversary. How many employees are in your Toronto office? So there are six right now. So right. it's a small operation. So not quite uh, ready. You've, you've almost got to though, start bringing your New York team to Toronto for a trip as well. Oh, uh, we, we would love that. We would love that. Maybe everybody, too. everybody from Toronto thinks they're New Yorkers anyway. So they're <laughs> they kind of a good affiliate. I used to live in Toronto years ago. So. Oh, I love it. I yeah, love it. Up there. So um, talk to me about the lessons that you got from the entrepreneurial family that you, that you lessons that you would carry with yeah. you, I guess, as the COO. So look, um, you know, my dad came over from Italy um, when he was 18 and built um, his own business. And so now he's a developer out here in California. Um, my mom worked right alongside him. Um, so they worked very hard and they were very fair. Um, you know, they never cheated anyone out of a dollar. They always respected all of their vendors um, and they treated everyone like a big extension of the family. And so when I joined again, N6A and met Matt, you know, even though I was an employee, I was a VP, I felt like every decision I had, I made, um, was as if the agency was my own, Mm. um, that, you know, I had created it. You know, I was very careful. In fact, if there were needs, I was the first one to volunteer and give up something if that meant someone else could have it. Um, because I had seen my parents do that and I knew how important it was to show loyalty and respect, um, not only to your colleagues, but also, you know, the owner, the, the person that had this vision and, and continues to create it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm watching my director of operations and she's my second in command right now, the way she runs the COO Alliance and how she, she does stuff that just, I, I'm like, wow, like she's buying gifts for people and she's buying them out of her own money. And she's taking yeah. money out of the bank machine and tipping people at the hotel where we're running conferences and she's doing it on her own. I'm like, well, yeah. start billing the company for this. Yeah. Stuff. She's like, oh no, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, it's amazing how she just feels this incredible sense of ownership and passion towards the business and the brand. And is that in the DNA or is that something the entrepreneur is instilling? Like, I don't know where it's come from. I don't think it's anything that I'm doing. So is it just from you? Is it, or Probably. is it, from, yeah, it's from you, right? You can identify the, the leaders, uh, the, you know, those entrepreneurs, um, they do operate. In fact, that's one of them. You know, they pick up dinner on their own dime, yeah. even though it is a business event. Um, they'll go the extra mile, you know, for the client in a way that maybe um, someone else wouldn't. Um, you know, it's in the details that matter. And, you know, people notice that. Um, and I think it's either, yes, it's probably you know, maybe it's installed in you by family members or mentors, or maybe it's just something that you have, um, you know, built within. Just part of your DNA. Yeah, absolutely. So part of your DNA, it sounds like is that real, real work ethic. And it may be the immigrant work ethic that your parents brought over where they just, they're going to do everything they can to succeed and there's nothing going to get in their way. And is that why Matt's trying to pull you out of some business areas is because you're just doing everything that's needed? So look, <clears throat> we, we are 50, so 40, I guess, on the floor in uh, Soho. So it's easy. And, and I actually, I love it. I love, you know, the biggest piece of, of the reasons why I guess I love my job is, is the people. Um, if I could, I would sit down with them. I would, I would probably go over maybe their fears, their challenges, things that I see in them that they don't see themselves. Um, and I, you know, being a VP had access to that, um, where now you know, I have, you know, a layer between me, I still have access to them, but um, I'm usually wanting to dive in um, and help them uh, troubleshoot, problem solve. Um, But sometimes, you know, you have to, you have to have your, you you have to have trust in your SVPs and we have the best SVPs who, um, you know, are are equally just as passionate as I am. Um, So I guess it's kind of a mama bear where I have to, you know, let them go and, and just help, um, yep. you know, from a, from another place, um, and and marry the two, the vision between Matt, our CEO, and you know what they're building and creating on the floor every day. So I've always believed that a, a leader's job is to grow people. Do you have any kind of personal mantras, personal leadership mantras that you follow or that you believe in? Uh, grow people. So look, um, there's no room for self doubt uh, and success. I think. You know, especially on the fly in our world, you know, we'll have a new business uh, meeting pop up the day of, um, and you know, there's there's a lot of nerves presenting uh, in front of new 
uh, members and also, you know, winning a business. And so I think the most important thing and what I tell everyone is to be yourself, believe in yourself. Um, a lot of the time, yes, of course, it's about the presentation. It's about your knowledge um, in the space, but it's also your energy and how important you make everyone else in the room feel and how excited you are about what they're building and how you want to be a part of that. And it's a simple thing, something that maybe somebody would never have told them. So, um, yep, awesome. leave, self, leave self-doubt at out of the door and, you know, believe in yourself um, because they often and always do end up shining. <laughs> Where do you think yeah. you're challenged currently in your role? I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, like Ray Kroc from McDonald's said, when we're green, we're growing. When we're ripe, we're rotting. So where <laughs> where are you growing right now as a leader? Look, for me, most important, I think it's, it's probably personal. It's just balance. Um, so I tend to be more of a sponge. So I do take, you know, I do take everything with me. Um, it's hard for me to leave things at the door. I think about it. I'll dream about it. Um, so I think as, you know, in this new role as COO, I have to be able to, um, just kind of draw, draw a line and make sure that, um, I've identified, let's say a problem or a challenge, um, and, you know, file it there. And then also work on a little bit more so of myself and how I can, you know, filter that out and and focus more so on scaling the business and the larger vision. Where where do you think you've grown in the past then? What have you had to work on to get you to here? Um, <laughs> like I said, disconnecting. So this year I, I, mm-hmm. I joined in on our sabbatical. We gave everyone a, a sabbatical at the agency, 30 days, um, where they can go and travel. So I took, a, I took about 10 days <laughs> uh, myself. <laughs> And I, I, I took my best friend from college. Four of, four of which were weekends, correct? So it was, it was technically four day work day, but, um, but yeah, it was 10 days total, which I completely disconnected because I was okay. in Iceland and there was no, you know, there was no internet connection and um, it was great. It was great. And I was able to, to laugh on a girl's trip and, and disconnect, but I definitely, I, I, I still think there's room for improvement there. I definitely could use uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, Daniela time. Yeah, that's that's the one that I really had to learn years ago. I remember I pulled my team together and I asked them to each write down three areas that I could continue doing that they thought I was really strong in and then three areas that I should improve on. And they all wrote them down on post-it notes and then they each read them out loud and posted them on the wall for me. And one of the ones that was consistent was I needed to get away from the company and take a break. And it was that I was stressing them out because I was so present all the time in the business. I was stressing them out because I was working so hard and they didn't think that was balanced. And they felt by me not being balanced and me not taking enough time off, I was reacting versus responding. I was um, getting angry quickly. I was just too intense. And um, they really felt for me to rise as a leader, I was to take more time off. And that was when we were only doing 30 million in revenue. Wow. I still had to do two doubles since then. So it was big feedback for me. And, and just dis- so I stopped working at night. I just stopped. Like at five o'clock at night, I shut down. I'm done. And um in fact, when, when you and I are finished this, this, I throw the dinner into the oven and I head to the gym and then I'll come back from the gym and hang out with my kids, but I won't work. And I try That's not right. to work at nights. I try not, never to work weekends. Um, and then vacations, the same thing. I mean, I'm guilty, unfortunately, of checking emails. So do you turn Me off? Too. Yeah, do you, you, you still do as well. I think we, that's the one that we've really got to lock ourselves away with is just it's hard to get rid of the phone. I tried that recently where I said I'd give it up for, uh, for a week. I ended up going 48 hours, but... <laughs> Damn. I've heard of this. Like it's yeah. hard, man. Yes, like, no, I've heard of this. Because like I didn't, yeah, like because I didn't have, I couldn't text. I didn't know where one of my kids was to go pick him up after an appointment. I didn't know, you know, uh, where I was supposed to pick him up after an appointment. I didn't have my map. I didn't have like a GPS. I didn't have like Google. It was amazing the amount of things we use, right? But it was actually really good to just be present. You know, there's nothing that I was really missing on the newspaper, and um, but yeah, it's it's amazing how I think just somehow turning off email. Um, there's got to be, is there any apps for that? So I think there, there, there has to be apps. Um, see, I get anxiety of not checking because what if, you know, there is an emergency. What if there's something that, you know, we could have prevented something that we could have helped out on and you know, I could have helped out. I know. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I feel like it's, it's kind of that FOMO. I don't know if there's, we have to create one for emails, but, um, you know, you're afraid of missing out on fun, but I'm also afraid of missing out on, you know, work stuff. Um, yeah. And I actually enjoy it. You know, you know, I'm here, you know, I, as I, as I travel, I, I enjoy touching base with, um, you know, our, my colleagues asking how their day went, what, what, you know, how did certain clients do with announcements? You know, you, you kind of 
Just do you think we're avoiding, body. are we avoiding something though? Are we avoiding something in our own lives? Are we avoiding connection with our friends or reaching out to the friends that we feel we've let go of or um, our hobbies? Like, are we filling the, because it's a dopamine rush, right? We get an excitement. Yeah. We get a buzz off of it. So I've been called out, um, especially on dates, which is not great. Ah. Um, when, you, you know, for having the phone, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big, you know, it's a turnoff when you're yeah. at dinner um, and somebody continues to check their phone or you're at, you know, a, a birthday party and somebody is, you know, continuously checking their phone on their phone. Yes, it can make the person feel not important. Um, that, that's when you know, I've actually just started to leave my phone in the car. Wow. When it, when it, yeah. No, it's good. Like, I like, I, I like that. I, like I learned that. this one. I learned this one. It was a story I told myself. Um, I said, you know, my grandfather told me that if he could play golf and run a company and he could play golf without calling into the, to the office, I could too. And I kind of told myself that story because he, he never said that to me, but both of my grandfathers ran their own companies wow. and they played golf. And I realized that if they could actually take five hours off to be on the golf course and completely disconnect, then Christ, I can too. So I started golfing without my phone. I got a, a GPS watch instead of checking my, you know, yardage on my phone. And then I just started doing it at dinners. And so now I'll go for a dinner date and I'll sit and I won't check my phone at all. Um, I'm trying not to bring it to the dinner table at home. So I just don't have it with me, but it's, it's an addiction that I think we have to break. So here's one for you. Do you Tell allow, me. do you allow phones to be brought into the meeting rooms? Hmm. That's a yes. So look, and, and <laughs> so we used to have a strict policy, especially with internal meetings. So new business meeting, no, no phones. Okay, okay um, great. You know, it's important. Because uh, you're trying to land the client. Well, absolutely. And we leave computers out as well. And some people do bring the computers in just to take notes. But, you know, I'm kind of old school where I love the notebook. Um, you know, we'll have a deck and so forth. But um, so no phones during new business. Um, we used to have a strict no phone policy when there were internal meetings. Um, I see that we've kind of, we've loosened up a little bit there. Yeah. So um, I've got, I put, I literally get like a wood salad bowl now and I leave it at the door of meeting rooms and I check the phone, even when we do the COO Alliance. So our COO Alliance is um, all these COOs from all over North America. And we meet for two full days and eight o'clock on Thursday morning, everyone puts their phone into the bowl and we don't touch it till 5 p.m. And it's like giving up a, a cocaine addiction. Like people are like all jittery, right? At the end of day one, they grab their phone Day two is a breeze, no problem at all. But we're, I'm now getting all of my clients, CEOs included, and just saying, look, if you can't sit in that internal meeting for a half hour or an hour without sure. your phone, it means you're too busy for the meeting. That's okay. Go do your other stuff. Good but point. Either be completely present and treat it like a client meeting where you're trying to land the client. Like everything should be as important as trying to land that client. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you're right. I like that. I think I'm going to have to revisit that now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so give me, give me something that's working for, for you guys in meetings. I'm, I'm kind of, I wrote the book Meetings Suck and I'm a little bit obsessed with meetings right now. So really, you walk me through what's working well for you in meetings. So look, I think what's working and what's really unique um, that we're doing, especially in, uh, we call it Matt, uh, our CEO's direct report meeting, is we rotate through a project and we call it Make the Company Better project. Mm. Um, so one of us will own it for the week and we'll present something. It could be anything. It could be um, related to our department could be an observation, um, could be a report. Uh, we're really big into data. Um, yeah. So that's just kind of how our PR firm operates. Um, we analyze internal data all the time, whether it's just, uh, you know, results, uh, client results, whether it's, you know, reten staff retention, um, hiring, all of that stuff. Um, and we, we, beat, we try to beat it every year. Um, so so for us, you know, these company better projects are amazing because we're learning from each other and we're able to get creative. Um, there are things that, you know, I think about on the way to work um, when I'm at home, when I'm traveling in Iceland. Um, <laughs> when you're not disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> but they never make it to my to-do list. Um, so now this is the opportunity for me to, to you know, bring it to life through a presentation you know, cool. with my colleagues. So I, yeah, that's something that works. And that meetings are great for that. Yeah, um, they are for sure. Yeah. That's cool. Tell me about um, Gen Y. I mean, the PR industry is notorious um, for being successful in, in leading a group of people that are Gen Y. So, sure. you know, most, I would guess that, that I'd say 90% of your workforce is between 22 and 37 years yes. old. Um, so I think they're getting a bad rap. I, I think they're also getting a, a very accurate rap, but, but 
tell me, tell me how you're successful in, um, in recruiting them, in onboarding them, and in keeping them for more than six months. So have you heard about our Pace Points program? No. Okay. So we had this idea one year. I just turned up my volume. <laughs> so look, you know, we, we were notorious. In fact, we just won um, Entrepreneurs uh, Top Company Cultures in America Award this yeah. year because we're really big on company culture. So, you know, look, we, we run the agency like a family, but we also reward our folks and they're competitive, you know, in the sense that compete and care is one of our uh, taglines. So it's very important that everyone, you know, obviously works well, but also is, is taking care of each other. So what we've done is we've blown this culture rewards program out of the park this year and we introduced pace points. So now, um, it, you know, we have team members who, rec who uh, will start to earn pace points based on, you know, coverage. So maybe they've placed um, coverage for their clients. Mm -hmm. um, they would had an outstanding month. Their team has won some awards. Their group has won some awards. And they have two windows um, every year where they can cash out on these points. Now, these points mm -hmm. are, um, they hit different buckets. So for you, Cameron, maybe you're interested in cash, cash only. Me, maybe I'm interested in opening up an office in Singapore and having an experience and, and you know, operating out of a WeWork, you know, somewhere. God in Singapore. forbid you'd have to take a vacation. God forbid, but <laughs> I actually love traveling. So, you know, there, there yeah, we Singapore decided, office would be cool. Uh, it would be amazing. And, you know, uh, we started to realize that our team members wanted, you know, they wanted to work from home because they felt they worked better working from home. They wanted mm -hmm. experiences. So now through these pace points that they, you know, accumulate, they're able to take one month sabbaticals. They're able to look at the health and wellness bucket and say, look, I can hire a celebrity trainer now and cash in my points and um, work with a celebrity trainer. I can go to a yoga retreat for a week in Bali. Um, and so we've created what looks like, um, think of kind of like your American like an Air Miles. Board. Yeah. Yes. And now you, we've done it in a way. It's kind of an e-commerce site that we built, where um, team members. And is this an is out. this an internal site that you're using, or is this it an is. external that you white labeled? It is internal. So it's internal. We've created it. In fact, uh, we're one of the few PR firms I think right now that have a full-time software engineer. So he's dedicated to building this portal. This is where we track performance. So we review. Really cool. <clears throat> we review everyone every month, including, you know, I get reviewed every month, so forth. And the CEO reviews himself every month. I love um, this idea. I, I, years ago, 11 years ago, I coached my third company that I ever coached was called Achievers. It used to be called I Love Rewards. And they built private label points programs for companies to put internally inside yeah. their companies. Oh, wow. They were actually based in Toronto. Okay. Um, but they had, so I Love Rewards was what they were called in Toronto and then Achievers. And they were, I think, five years in a row ranked as one of the top companies to work for in Canada. But this this points program is huge. It works well. So you call it PACE? pace we call points? it PACE points because Love Embrace it. the Pace is um, our, our one of our taglines. We have six. So we do everything in sixes and 6A. Six um, so that, that motivates people and it's also built in retention right. as well because they've got all these points built up. They don't want to leave, right? No, exactly. So, you know, retention is great, but I will say, you know, Generation Y and, you know, this new generation, I love them because they keep you on your feet. Um, they're really big into transparency, feedback. Oh, huge. Um, yeah. I remember when I started my career, I don't think I ever asked anybody for feedback, which I probably should have. I just kind of, I worked and I overworked to make sure that, you know, I was doing my job and I was doing it well and they felt the passion and I guess the work ethic. Well, I think with um, social media, they're also so used to getting positive yes. and constructive criticism. Like they yes. just, it's like, okay, that was feedback. Great. And they move on. They don't, they don't get all worried about the feedback because they're used to getting it every yeah. minute. No, you know what? We, we realized, and I go back to this, you know, pace points and then work from home policy. So two years ago, we didn't have a work from home policy. In fact, mm. we kind of had one. It was kind of, you can take one every quarter if, you know, if you need it, um, but we, we would love everyone to be in the office. And then of course you have your PTOs if you need to go and yeah. you know, take care of them or go on vacation. When we announced it to the staff, um, they were so upset. It came in, so we do surveys as well every quarter where, you know, it's anonymous and they can ask questions, they can give feedback, and then we present um, all of their questions and, you know, we communicate the feedback to kind of a, ta a town hall setting. Um, and work from home was a huge one. They were so upset about that. So now we said, um, fine, we're going to meet you. Um, if you hold a certain uh, point, uh, if you perform well, 
um, you can have unlimited work from home. Yeah. No questions asked. It's, it's and- interesting. I think, we, I think we've now gotten to the point where for the, certainly for the best culture companies and best places to work, working from home is no longer looked at as a perk. It's just, well, of course we do. You know, it's just, yeah. that's where people actually now work. It's, it's, you work from remote. It also allows people to travel and as long as it is, but it has to be a pure meritocracy and you got to get your shit done. Um, yes. But yeah, you want to go live in Bali for a month, go live in Bali for a month. As long as you're showing up for work, I don't care. Like I just, yes. I just got off a, co- a coaching call, coaching a client who's based in Bulgaria. Wow. That was 10 hours time zone difference. They didn't care. We're on zoom. We talked face to face. We had a great reaction, spoke for 90 minutes, Bob's your uncle, right? <laughs> um, and I, and I think, as, and, and there'll be accountability and we'll use, you know, some online tools to follow up that, yeah, it just starts to make sense. It's, I'm glad you brought it up. because I was going to ask you about the remote versus in office. So are you looking to, and I, it also allows us to hire people from anywhere, right? Instead of saying, well, you have to be based in Toronto. Well, what if I'm based in Winnipeg or what if I'm based in, you know, right. Quad Cities, Iowa, um, and I happen to want to live there, God forbid, but, you know, <laughs> um, but why shouldn't we be able to hire them? So are, are you going after those people now cog- consciously or are you more open to hiring people who are remote so or not we are, yet? We are definitely in a position where we are, you know, open to hiring folks remote, especially as we look, you know, at the West Coast or working mm. with um, folks who represent, let's say, um, the European market. So these are things that we're open to now. I would say, you know, now because we're 50. Um, before we were a lot smaller, it was important for all of us to, you know, you know, build the team together. Um, and I probably am still a little bit old fashioned in the sense I do love coming to work. Um, I do appreciate working from home once in a while, but I, you know, I, I like communicating in person, you know, with, with the team. So it's something for me, but it's not for everyone, you know, some design positions, for instance, or, um, you know, our software engineer, they come into the office, but there's nothing that stops. Uh, so no. I'm saying if you need to go and work from, you know, home um, during the month of December, go for it. Um, yeah, I think we're going to see yeah. a huge trend over the next 10 years towards this. I have a, a client that I coached out of, um, I don't even know where they're out of because they have, they have 85 employees and no one works in the same office at all. No, they don't have an office. Um, it's called Acceleration Partners. They rank as the 12th best company in North America to work on on Glassdoor wow. and they don't have an office at all. And they, they never had an office. They just started that way right so then i would say you'd probably have to invest more so on sort of company retreats right Uh, yeah they they do a couple retreats a year and they do everything they actually have days where i forget what they call it but they'll have people just sitting with zoom open working Hmm. just like we're hanging out at a table working together and you'll see somebody like tapping away and they're kind of like a little giggle there's a (laughs) smile or, or you'll say hey kelly like there's just this like casual hanging out together that I think people get. And I think technology has definitely made it easier. I mean, look, you know, Skype, I don't know when Skype started, but maybe 10 years ago, um, yeah, maybe 15, yeah. but it hasn't been that long, you know? So the baby boomers are, the baby boomers are really the ones that are pushing against it because they don't know anything other than going and driving to work and sitting there nine to right. five and driving home. Like, right. So they're the ones that are more against it, whereas I think Gen Y are just so used to it. Right. I will say, though, you know, we do have, like, for instance, in our case, some clients will fly in and they, they do want to see, you know, the entire team. So, like, those are moments yeah. where we'll, yes, for sure. you know, we'll have to override and say, guys, you know, make it in. Um, or maybe we all meet at a WeWork location somewhere. This is true. I was, I was, in, uh, I was in Lima, Peru last week, and I went into wow. a we, WeWork location down there. I'm like, God, like you don't need to have a local office, just all meet here. And there's an re- awesome restaurant across the street and a fantastic hotel around the corner. And it's easy. Lima, Peru. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was speaking down there. It was fun. That's great. Yeah. So there you go. So, so um, you mentioned family and someone told me that, I guess you and I had similar families because whenever we say that, you know, it's like a family environment, someone said, you know, some of us had really dysfunctional oh, families. Oh. And I'm like, Ooh, good point. Like maybe I won't talk about us being like a family anymore when you realize that some people had like, families that were a little off. That's actually a good point. I've never so, really. But, but I'm not like, I'm not, I'm just, I was like, Ooh, that was interesting. Right. But I think, I think it's around building a culture or building something. I had a client one time, they go, well, we don't really have a culture. I'm like, well, that's your culture. It's kind of beige. How would you describe um, N6A's culture and, and tell us about your core values that you guys live out? I'm sure you have them and, and you kind of live them as a company. Right. So look, um, 
togetherness, I guess, would be, you know, I maybe we substitute the family and just think about, um, mm. you know, togetherness. And that's, yeah, that's kind cool. Of, that's how I we offer. It. Yeah. And I, I should think about that. I guess the Italian in me, family, it's just something that comes natural. But I you're agree. right. Yeah. I grew up in a city filled with Italian families. I get it. <laughs> right? right. So, and there is, you know, there is a lot of food. So I also define family with food. Yeah. Um, but there is Especially a lot of food with, in our agency. Yes, absolutely. It's but, like seven um, courses, you know, before <laughs> we get to, before we get to the rabbit. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, but then, you know, I would say, so togetherness is huge. Uh, mm. You know, we work together, we, we meet um, all of, you know, the agency together, at least uh, once, once a week. Um, we love to experiment. Um, so, Experimentation is key uh, for the agency. So uh, whether it's for you know for our culture, and when I say culture, our perks program, um, how we can make the, the company better, um, and then just innovation in the sense that um, you know we're, we're continuously looking at ways where we can improve the customer service experience. I mean, we're in the service industry; it's all about our customer. Um, how do we continue to improve and build those relationships? Um, because let's face it, you know, again, in our world, it's, it's the relationships we have with our team. It's the relationships we have with the media. It's the relationships we have with the client. Um, so we continuously work at that. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a sense um, in, our, in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, speed is probably something I would also, you know, slide in there. Um, we are very quick. So, um, yeah, one day of training, one day. Well, now it's changed. Now we have actually a dedicated, um, so Nina Velasquez is, is one of our SVPs. She's been with the company for six years, oh. uh, on the service side, uh, did great work with the service team and then, uh, kind of graduated, was promoted into this new role where she heads talent. Um, so she does training events, uh, recruiting events. Uh, she takes, you know, two weeks to actually properly onboard them um, and install, because as you, as you mentioned, we're kind of at that point now, you know, 50, where it's important that they also know, you know, our, the new members, our roots um, and how we used to, you know, service clients back when we were 15 uh, people. And it was kind That's of cool. like, roll up your sleeve, let's jump in no matter, you know, what role you're, you're in. Um, it's all about the client. We respond to our emails right away. Um, we used to have um, a year of the customer where we modeled uh, programs every month around big brands that we admired. And um, Nordstrom had this uh, policy where after the third ring, you had to call or so you would get some sort of a discount if they didn't pick up after the third ring. Um, so now we did uh, six minutes because we do everything in sixes. You have to respond to an email. Make sure that the client knows you've received the email, um, that you're working on it, whether you answer it or just simply say, look, um, I'll get wow. back to you. That's fast. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's important. We were joking because we had a, a new business client come in who is Italian and they, they loved that, that piece, but they they said, you must forgive us. We're Italian. Um, we'll take 20 minutes to probably right. get back. <laughs> six minutes and six days. Yes. Or six minutes and six hours. Yeah, it was great. So what's um, one, one last question. What's a, I guess a parting word of advice you'd have for anyone who is either starting off in their career as a second in command or really growing into a leadership role um, or even anyone in leadership, what, what advice would you give them that's worked well for you? Um, look, I think the never lose sight of your people. Um, so make sure, um, it's opposite for me, but make sure you are meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, everyone from account coordinator up, um, listen and, um, you know, bring that feedback to your CEO and, and don't be afraid to push back. Um, if there are things that you're not really aligning on, um, because, Sometimes, you know, it's, it's as a CEO, you're, you're, you're thinking about the vision, you're, you're meeting, um, you know, your meetings are different than, let's say, the COO's meetings. Um, I, I know the, the pulse of the agency, um, so it's important that you continue um, to deliver, um, you know, that, that energy and, and that, um, I guess, vibe over into uh, the CEO's world. That's awesome. Nina yeah. Mancinelli, or uh, Danielle Mancinelli, sorry. Uh, Matt is lucky to have you in the second in command Thank role. You. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And Thank you. Really appreciate all the ideas and the lessons you shared today. Thank you so much. And, Thanks, uh, Danielle. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Second in Command with Cameron Harold. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe. To learn more best practices from industry-leading COOs, please visit COOalliance.com. <laughs>